Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Yeager. I'm the executive director of the Furman Center. Thanks for joining us here this morning for our policy breakfast, reforming rent stabilization in New York City. I'm going to start us off today with some facts that we hope will be helpful background for the panel discussion that will follow. So first, a fact about tenants. The median income of tenants living in rent stabilized units is lower than the median income of market rate tenants. In recent years, the income of rent stabilized tenants has grown more slowly than the income of market rate tenants as well. Now a few facts about the stock. Close to half of the rental units in New York City are rent stabilized. In 2017, there were 960,000 rent stabilized units in the city. Most units are subject to rent stabilization because they're in buildings that were built before 1974 and they have six or more units. In, 19, I'm sorry, in 2017, there were about um, 857,000 units in this category, which is about 91% of the stabilized units in the city. A much smaller number of units are stabilized because they are participating in an affordable housing subsidy program. Since 1994, there's been a net loss of about 148,000 rent stabilized units in the city. High rent vacancy deregulation is the primary cause of losses to the stock, followed by units converting to co-ops and condos. The largest source of additions to the stock is the 421A tax exemption program. The additions because of 421A significantly outnumber the losses due to 421A expirations. The rent stabilization laws, which are controlled by Albany, limit rent increases in stabilized units. The increases allowed with lease renewals are sent by the Rent Guidelines Board. This year, the renewal lease increase permitted is 1.5% for a one-year lease and 2.5% for a two-year lease. Owners can also raise rents above that amount for three reasons. The first is vacancy. When a unit is vacant, the owner is permitted to raise the rent by about 20%. The second two are major capital improvements and individual apartment improvements. When owners make qualified improvements to their buildings or apartments, they can raise the rent. How much the rent can rise and which um, improvements qualify are set by law. <coughs> On average, rent stabilized units have lower rents than market rate units. And in recent years, the median rent in stabilized units has risen more slowly than the median rent in market rate units. This graph shows the distribution of rent stabilized units across different rent levels. Just over half of the stabilized units in the city rent between $1,000 a month and $1,600 a month. Over 13% of the stabilized units are renting between $1,900 and $2,700 a month. And about 5%, or 46,000 units, have rents that exceed the deregulation threshold, which is currently $2,733.75 which is shown here with the black line. These units remain stabilized because they, it's required by the subsidy program that they're participating in. I'm now gonna briefly describe four proposals that are currently pending in Albany to reform components of the rent stabilization laws. And these are issues that the panelists will be discussing today. Vacancy allowance, high rent vacancy deregulation, major capital improvements, and preferential rents. Vacancy allowance is the amount that the legal rent for a stabilized unit can increase for a new tenant. How it works today is, upon vacancy, an owner can increase the legal rent by about 20%. But there are a few exceptions to that rule. Most notably, as of 2015, the vacancy allowance will be less than this if the prior tenant had a preferential rent and that tenant moved in less than four years ago. There's a pending proposal in both the Senate and Assembly to eliminate the vacancy allowance. With two vacancy allowances, about 124,000 units that are currently stabilized will exceed the deregulation threshold. And there are about 42,000 units that are stabilized that will become deregulated with one vacancy allowance. Next is high rent vacancy deregulation. 
As I mentioned earlier, this is the mechanism by which stabilized units are most likely to leave rent stabilization. Once the legal rent in a stabilized unit reaches the deregulation th threshold and the existing tenant moves out, the unit is no longer stabilized. Here again, there are bills pending in both the Senate and Assembly to eliminate this form of deregulation. A third topic is major capital improvements. After making qualified building improvements, an owner can apply to HCR, the state's housing agency, to increase the rent based on those costs. If HCR approves the MCI, the rent can increase by an amount that's equal to the cost of the improvement divided by 96 months or 108 months, depending on the size of the building. There's a bill pending in the Senate to make MCI as a temporary surcharge rather than a permanent increase to the rent. Finally, preferential rents. A preferential rent is any amount that an owner charges that's less than the legal rent. The legal rent is the most that an owner is permitted to charge for a unit under the rent stabilization rules. Currently, with any lease renewal, even for an existing tenant, an owner can raise the rent from a preferential rent to the, any amount up to the legal rent. Bills pending in the Senate and Assembly would only permit increases from the preferential <laughs> rent to the legal rent upon vacancy. And with that, I'd like to invite our moderator, Mark Willis, um, to the podium. Mark is the Senior Fo Policy Fellow at the Furman Center, and I'd also like to invite our panelists up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. So let me welcome uh, our panelists. Uh, we have uh, a terrific uh, uh, group here, uh, all very articulate, very well informed, um, and uh, all uh, prepared to help share with us uh, some of their uh, perspectives on, on this whole issue. So uh, in no particular order, I guess, I have um, here, I'll start at this side, Joe Strasburg uh, from uh, Rent Stabilization, Stabilization Association, the president. By the way, you have more extensive uh, bios uh, uh, in the materials that you uh, found at your seat. Uh, Judith Goldener, uh, who is the attorney in charge of the Civil Rights Reform Unit, Legal Aid Society. Betsy Mallow, uh, Executive Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer of New York State Homes and Community Renewal. And Chris Mayer, Paul Milstein, Professor of Real Estate, Professor of Finance, and Co-Director of the Paul Milstein Center for Real Estate uh, at Columbia Business School. So thank you all. Um, now I, I, I should point out here that you'll find at your seats uh, cards uh, for you can uh, use to write questions or you can tweet uh, your questions here. Uh, we'll be collecting those uh, comments over the course of, uh, of the discussion here. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that uh, for the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, we will uh, uh, be looking at those questions and um, ask the panel uh, uh, to respond. So uh, let me start here uh, uh, again by thanking the panelists for agreeing to uh, help us uh, parse through what can be <clears throat> a very complicated topic. Uh, I should point out, I know this will be uh, no surprise to the audience um, and to the response we got to this. Uh, this is a highly charged issue, uh, and the issues are actually more complex than sometimes the public debate uh, might suggest. Uh, the purpose of this discussion is to air the issues uh, surrounding the possible changes to New York City's rent stabilization system. <clears throat> I would like to note uh, that it is unfortunate how um, charged this uh, uh, whole <laughs> issue is. Um, my own uh, experience here in trying to put together a panel uh, was to find out uh, that uh, the debate uh, in, in putting this together how um, Onus uh, are uh, viewed by so many people as, as villains, um, as a group. Uh, we can talk about individuals if you want, but as a group. Uh, uh, so much so that it was hard to get any owner uh, to even participate in the public discussion. I, I found that uh, very unfortunate. Um, although I'm very happy to have Joe <laughs> doing that. Um, but I thought having a real landlord might be of interest to people to actually see one. Um, <laughs> 
So um, I'm not expecting this event will uh, uncover new common ground or will be a venue for negotiation. Uh, feel free if you want to afterwards to solve all these problems. Uh, but hope it will simply help us all better understand what is at stake. So I, I'd like to start just at a very high level in what I'll call lightning rounds. So um, uh, for the first uh, round, um, I, I'd like to start with a four-part question uh, for Judith, Joe, and Betsy. And uh, just so Chris doesn't feel bad, I have a modification of that question uh, for Chris, since uh, he's not so uh, uh, involved in the intricacies <laughs> of New York City and New York State uh, law. Uh, but uh, can talk a little bit about rent regulation uh, more generally. So um, here's the four parts. Uh, briefly, what do you each see as the most important goal uh, or goals that you're looking for rent stabilization to achieve? Second, uh, how well is the current system addressing those goals? Uh, and what are the specific aspects of the current system that you want to see remedied? Again, I'm just looking for a list here. We're going to delve into all of these topics in quite a, a fair amount of detail. Um, and uh, what possible downsides uh, do you see of opening up the specifics of the law? So um, I can start. Judith, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think it's important when you talk about rent regulation to remember what we're talking about. So we're talking about um, a scheme that has been in place in some, some form since the 20s, but more, you know, really more recently since the 1940s and then again in the 1970s. So we're talking about a system in New York City that's been around for a very long time. Um, you're talking about a very diverse, um, diverse bunch tenants who are impacted by this. So majority of tenants who are rent regulated are people of color. Um, it disproportionately helps women. That probably doesn't surprise us. It, um, it provide, it's a true mixed income system. Um, which some of us purport to think is a good idea when we're talking about getting rid of other things that really serve the poor. Um, and it is the largest um, source of housing for low-income people in New York City. So I think uh, it's Are those goals that you're talking about here? No, but I think it's important to frame what we're talking about when we talk about rent regulation because sometimes okay. that gets away from us. In terms of the goals, what's often forgotten with rent regulation is it's an, it's both a price, con somewhat of a loose price control as well as an eviction protection. And that eviction protection part is very important because the ability to have tenure is one of the most important goals of, of rent regulation. So correcting this power imbalance that we see when you have a system in a market like New York where the vacancy rate is so low, where it's so hard to find housing, it's very important to not just limit rent increases, but limit the ability of landlords to evict except for a good reason. So all of our ability as tenant advocates to correct bad conditions, to um, advocate for tenants, to um, organize, to get to address abusive behavior by landlords is because of those two things. One, that there are limits on the ability of a landlord to raise the rent, and two, an ability to have tenure in your apartment. And that increases longevity in the apartments. Some look at that as a bad thing. I think it's a really good thing. It's why we have vibrant communities in the city for a very long time. In terms of shortcomings, deregulation is a big shortcoming. It, it changes this balance. Vacancy increases undermine affordability. Preferential rents destroy benefits for tenants. Enforcement by tenants only, which is essentially the system we have, doesn't work. Because the regulatory agencies are underfunded, because tenants are afraid, and because we need a more robust enforcement system. And we need to get rid of incentives that provide, that allow landlords to do bad things. Um, I'm concerned as we go forward that any reforms we're gonna get this year might be purely cosmetic. And that 2015 change that Jesse talked about is one of those changes. We didn't advocate for that. It wasn't, a, you know, it's not an important or meaningful change. In terms of changes we want to see, we want to get rid of vacancy decontrol, because as I said, decontrol destabilizes the whole system, and we're seeing how that plays out in real time. 
the, the, a vacancy bonus, which we refer to as the eviction bonus. It just rewards a landlord to, for evicting a tenant. And um, lastly, the preferential rents. We really need to reform the preferential rents to bring it back to the way it was traditionally, which is that when you have a preferential rent, your landlord can't uh, raise the rent for that tenant. And so that's the list of reforms we'd sure, like to Thank see. you. Thank you. Joe? Um, let me just <coughs> respond by saying that, you know, when somebody talks about reform, you know, what usually conjures up is the ability to have a discussion and negotiations as to what the final uh, item should look like. But under this kind of a discussion, reform is purely elimination. Uh, so let's talk about some of the items that um, the advocates have been arguing that should be reformed. Uh, I believe that vacancy, um, the 20 percent vacancy bonus upon vacancy, there was a reason that it was inserted back in 1997. And that was to allow owners to, um, who had tenants who were there for a very long time to be able to get the extra cash flow in order to invest in their buildings. Um, the, the one thing that has never really, we've never really had a substantive debate over is who should be receiving the benefits of rent stabilization protection. Uh, a means testing. In any other housing program that exists, whether it's federal or state, government requires that those who are in most need should get those apartments. But that debate is, never happens whether it, it, and it doesn't matter what period of time uh, it's happened, 1997, 1992, 94, there is a lack of a substantive debate on any and every issue that comes up. We may have a disagreement, but there's always been a policy reason as to why certain provisions were inserted. So let's talk about preferential rents. Um, we've had anecdotal arguments made by the advocates that say that owners suck you in as a tenant on a preferential rent. Yeah, I, we're I, going to get into these I, in more okay. detail. Let, let's but, uh, let's okay, stay so at let me go, this high, high lightning round. Uh, this is lightning, okay. right? This is, I know. But <laughs> lightning, the reality I guess, is right. that when you're dealing, uh, the goals are, well, number one, I congratulate the Democrats on having won this, uh, the state Senate, and they really should thank Donald Trump for that uh, great victory. Um, <laughs> number, number two, um, it is my hope that as we get into the uh, substance of the debate and the expiration of laws, that there really is a meaningful debate over some of the cons of it. Because if you don't have it and people don't understand the consequences of eliminating or so-called reforming some of these issues, the one thing this city does not want to see is private housing turn into NYSHA. Mm -hmm. Because if you shut off the, va the spigot, the valve, for owners to be able to um, put money back into their buildings and the average age of most of the buildings are 80 years old, you are going to find uh, a level of abandonment and deterioration over the many years. Thank you. All right. Betsy? Good morning. First off, thank you to Mark for um, taking on the challenge of moderating this panel uh, and to Furman for um, making the space for a very important discussion. Um, I get the pleasure of going after these two, so I can basically say that um, my, uh, my goals are in, in large measure um, sort of a sum of the two things that they said. I think the rent stabilization system was designed to provide protections to tenants with regard to affordability, habitability, and security of tenor, and you heard that and more from Judith, obviously. Um, but importantly, also doing so while maintaining um, the ability for owners to get a fair return on their investment and, um, and, and to be um, incented to invest in, in these buildings, which you heard from Joe, um, and more, obviously. Um, I think uh, with respect to the shortcomings, I would, I would pick up on something that Mark said um, to start, which is I, as we have this conversation, I want to um, refocus us for a second, right? We're talking about almost a million apartments. We're talking about 45,000 buildings. Um, it's a system that's enabled people to um, live in New York City with the protections they deserve. And it's a system that's based on the successes of a private-public par partnership and one that we need to maintain. Um, and so we spend a lot of time talking about shortcomings, about villains, about, um, you know, owners not wanting to sit on this panel. Um, but in, in point of fact, there are, um, sure, there are bad actors, right? There are people who are 
um, speculating and over leveraging. There are people who are um, uh, who are abusing the system, but there are also many, many, many people <laughs> um, who are um, doing things just right um, and who are enabling a system that provides um, many, many deserving tenants with the affordable and habitable housing that they deserve. So I just want to make sure that as we have this conversation, but also as we go into next year, um, when we think about reform, we're thinking about um, you know, ensuring that the bad actors are held accountable, um, but also mm -hmm. creating a system that enables um, both sides of the goal that I originally articulated. I would say um, from a policy perspective, um, to me that means um, you know, looking back to the 90s and early 2000s when there were a series of reversals for the tenant protections, right? So we'll talk about them, but in 93, the introduction of the deregulation threshold, in 97, the introduction of the vacancy bonus, in 2003, um, abolishing uh, preferential rents during, ten uh, abolishing the notion that the preferential rent would last for the entire tenancy. Um, and since then, Governor Cuomo has been committed to limiting the impacts of these changes. Um, we saw that in the first two extensions under this administration. And this upcoming year, um, uh, we, this administration continues to be committed to, um, uh, to Im improving the law, to eliminating vacancy decontrol, to ensuring that landlords aren't rewarded financially for schemes to force tenants out. Um, to relook at the formulas for rent increases for building and apartment improvements, and to make the preferential rent the operating rent, um, to make it operate as the legal rent for the life of the tenancy. Um, I think we also have to look closely at limitations that are created by a system that largely relies on self-reporting and that has limited penalties. Um, that's on the policy front. I have the great pleasure of every day actually thinking about the operations of this as well. Um, and it's a challenge, and it's a challenge that I love. Um, and I would say on that front, um, we've worked, uh, and I'm sorry, I know this is a lightning round, but I'll try and go fast. Uh, uh, we've worked very hard, but need to continue um, to increase efficiency of processing cases, to increase the ease of transacting with our office, the Office of Rent Administration, or ORA, um, and to improve transparency. I am proud to say that under um, <coughs> Governor Cuomo and, and Commissioner Visnowskis' leadership, um, or Ruth Ann, as many of you know her, right. leadership, um, we've gotten processing times down. Um, just after I started overcharge cases, I promise I'm gonna go quick. Yeah, right. um, we're 26 <laughs> months, then, um, they, we got them down to 12. Um, MCIs were nine, we got them down to six. Um, they've crept up a little, but we're hiring some folks who are retired and we're gonna get back um, to those objectives. Um, regarding the ease of transacting, we're working with an antiquated technology system, as many of you know. We're working very hard to transform it. As we do it, we're incredibly focused on the citizen experience. Um, and we're working to launch a portal where citizens will be able to do more online. They'll be able to transact um, akin to the way you transact in a, you know, with your bank online to get um, information to navigate the um, loads and loads of information that we have online. And with respect to transparency, we recently released an RFP um, for a contractor to help us simplify much of the public-facing documentation that we have. Um, I think that um, you shouldn't, you know, need a um, graduate degree to, under, to understand material from government, and so we're going to try and work to simplify that um, dramatically. Um, concerns on reform? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I think the concern is that there isn't a conversation, that there isn't a true debate, that there isn't, um, you know, that somehow the reform would come down way on one side um, of the of the balance. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Betsy. So uh, I've, uh, we've asked an economist uh, uh, to be part of this. Uh, he does not necessarily represent all economists, so, uh, but he, uh, he does uh, have a perspective on here that I've asked uh, uh, Chris to share, share with us on how he sees this whole issue of rent regulation in terms of long and short and long-term impact on cities in general or, or, or uh, more specifically on a city like uh, New York City. Thanks, Mark, um, and I appreciate being the token economist um, <laughs> on a panel. Um, and I will also say, though, that rent control is probably, along with trade, one of 
you know, two or three issues that across the spectrum, economists generally have the same view as to how to think about the issue. Um, virtually all economists think that we ought to Oh, you know, we ought to have free trade because it's beneficial, and I would say virtually all economists um, would agree that rent control creates very perverse incentives that are often counter and harm many of the people they're intending on helping. Um, so let me just sort of start with an example. You know, how many of you like pizza? <laughs> A lot of you like pizza? How many of you wish we had the dollar slice? back again. That's right. <laughs> Dollar slice hard to find. There are a few places. Suppose we decided that it's actually, ha food has become really expensive in New York. And what we're going to do is not allow pizza places to charge more than a dollar for a slice of pizza. What do we think is going to happen? Are we going to have high quality pizza, good pizza, pizza you want to eat? <laughs> or are we going to have, and then we're going to tell you that, by the way, if you have a pizza place, you can't close it. So in any other context, if we thought about the idea of putting a cap on the price of something, we should expect a couple things. One, we should expect the quality of that item, whatever it is, will go down, and that there won't be more people opening up stores or restaurants to provide that. And in particular, if what we really wanted to do was decided that food was less expensive, probably the craziest way to provide more food would be to tax people to pay for the lower cost food by taxing only the people that provide food and run restaurants. And that's really, in essence, what rent control does. I should sort of say that I think housing affordability is an incredibly important issue. And it's really clear in the elections in New York and in living in New York that the cost of housing is, if not the most important issue in the city, virtually the most important issue. And so it is an incredibly important thing that we be able to provide affordable, safe, and secure housing for residents of New York. So this is not an argument that is just we need a free market where everything goes. It's really an argument that says we need to think about how to most effectively achieve that goal in a way that really works and where the evidence suggests is successful. So let me give a couple of examples. Rent control causes people to build less housing, and in particular, it, it discourages people from building lower-priced housing, and it encourages people to build condos as opposed to rental units. Um, that has been shown in studies in San Francisco where rent control um, was put into place in 1994. There have been some very good studies in Massachusetts. Um, New York is hard because New York has had policies for so long that it's hard to look at, but it's probably not surprising to look and see where rents are in New York and think, you know what, if we had more housing, we would probably have lower rents. And we're even seeing that at the top end of the market, where we've actually had overbuilding and we've seen rents fall. Um, that's what happens when you have supply, is that it brings down the cost. Um, studies in San Francisco done at Stanford found the implementation of rent control led to a 5.1% increase in rents and a 15% decrease in supply, and that was a rent control system put into place in 1994. So the New York system almost surely has led to higher excess rents and lower relative supply than what was done in San Francisco. In Massachusetts, studies found that when they decontrolled rents in Massachusetts, there was a reduction in crime, um, and it increased the price of both non-rent controlled and rent controlled units. And there were a couple of studies that have actually found that there were neighborhood changes in places where there was rent control. You might sort of say that's odd. So I've, I've talked to my hairdresser, which may or may not be the right place to get data as an economist, <laughs> um, but she lives in an apartment in Brooklyn that's been broken into twice. And her concern is that why don't we put a camera, a video camera, in the lobby and to try and actually provide protections in her apartment. And the problem is the landlord has no incentive to really make improvements in the property or to do things that might otherwise be beneficial. 
because she's going to be living in the apartment and staying in that apartment for a long time. Many landlords are great people and will do it, um, but I have always been a believer that if you want something to happen, you need to create incentives for both sides for that to happen. Rent control creates very perverse incentives. And the perverse incentives actually encourage bad behavior by landlords. It, I don't think it takes good people and turns them into bad landlords, but what it does is it rewards landlords whose behavior would otherwise be poor relative to landlords who beha whose behavior is good. So people who want to skirt the law are actually being subsidized by a rent control system because they're the ones who can create the greatest value from the units so in essence, the economic system encourages purchases of units by landlords who will skirt the law and do things that are inappropriate, have them get rid of people from those units, and then turn around and sell it and reap an economic gain. And that's really unfortunate to reward bad behavior as opposed to good behavior in units. Um, it encourages builders to build things that are not going to be subject to rent control. And so I think, you know, we're kind of in a, I don't know if I got out of the lightning round, but, you know, as we think about the system, we should sort of think about how do we best achieve the goals of affordable housing? And can we create a system which more broadly spreads the economic costs of that, which would be among all higher income people to help pay for affordable housing as opposed to landlords of buildings? And then how do we do it in a way that encourages landlords to maintain, provide a safe and secure environment, as opposed to trying to sort of say, we're gonna come in and enforce this rule and that rule, because it's a little bit like whack-a-mole. Somebody comes up with another idea all the time, whether it's a poor door or all these sort of, you know, really kind of goofy, horrible ideas, we probably should have a system that doesn't encourage bad behavior, but actually rewards good behavior because Landlords will leave and they will take vouchers or things with them to go to a place where they're provided good affordable housing. So we're gonna, the rest of the conversation, I think we'll lose track of almost all of um, these points because we're gonna get into the weeds about an existing system. But as you think about that, and as you hear many of the conversations, sort of think back to the idea of, is this whole thing taking us down a path that is the most important path? And my last question is, how many students do we have in the room? How many of you are worried about living in New York and having an affordable place to live? How many of you think you're going to be in a uh, rent-stabilized apartment? One, <laughs> two, three. So for the students and young people in the room, as you think about this, recognize that the biggest beneficiaries are people who have lived in units for the longest time, and the biggest losers are people who don't end up, start in a unit, and that has in effect that is, may or may not be an intended effect because it does not make housing more affordable for young people. Young people who want to live in the city are the ones who are far and away suffer the most harm from rent control. So Chris, uh, thank you. Um, I'm <laughs> gonna come right back to you here uh, because- um, Haven't I said enough? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> more than enough. <laughs> no, I think, I, uh, you know, the, the point of this was to set perspectives and we have, there, um, as you pointed out, we have a system and as Betsy pointed out, we're trying to get the right balance here. Uh, my last lightning round uh, question here was, <laughs> what other tools are there to try and get that right balance, to deal with this very serious affordable housing problem that we have um, and, um, and to grow and maintain a healthy housing stock? So, so yeah. There was a program years ago called there. Rent to Opportunity, you know, um, Moving to Opportunity, right. which was a program that gave vouchers to poor people who were living in public housing in Chicago and then in a series of other cities. The data that came out of that program showed that while there was not much of a benefit to the people who got the vouchers, there was a very big benefit to the kids who were living in communities which ended up being um, so I'm going to cut through. So, so uh, right. So, so vouchers, vouchers that are means-tested right. vouchers, right. that allow people to live where they want. The data generally has been good. I'm not saying the federal implementation of Section 8 has right. been exactly the way you would want to do it. So, but you could create a local voucher system that allowed people to have vouchers to take to live in places that would be means-tested and targeted towards low-moderate income households. Right. Judith. 
Any thoughts on? Uh... <laughs> no, no, wait, wait. We're still in the lightning round. We're still in the lightning. Well, any any that thoughts that on what other tools <laughs> would be available here, in addition to whatever you think we should do in rent stabilization to help deal with the affordability problem? It's a very, okay, a very well, narrow question. Let me say that I I do think that there needs to be some response to the idea that getting rid of rent regulation would do anything to reduce rents or encourage building in New York City, because we are. We can look at the experience of Cambridge, and, f and what we realize from the experience of Cambridge is that what happened in Cambridge when they got rid of rent regulation is, yeah, there were a lot of losers, and the losers were low-income people and elderly people. And what we saw was massive evictions of those people and massive increases in rent and a situation where you had a place in Cambridge that was no longer a diverse, integrated uh, place anymore. And you could want that in New York City. And no offense to the students in the room, let me say one thing. I'm more concerned about my poor elderly clients than I am about people who are getting college and law degrees. Because let me just say, you people are getting college and law degrees, and I'm a lawyer, I graduated from this law school, you'll find housing. You will. You're going to make good salaries, you'll find housing. Even if you come to work for legal aid, we will find you housing. Okay? But, what, but my clients, my clients don't have that opportunity. If you want to live in a city that's integrated, you want to live in a city that's economically mixed, you want to live in a city where, you know, a, a low income uh, worker can live, then you want to preserve rent regulation. And if you don't want that city and you want a city with none of those things, then sure, get rid of rent regulation and then you will have a city that is not a city that I know I want to live in. Um, but in terms of, but in terms of, uh, obviously I would, we favor both a state and a city voucher system. But that's not enough, right? Like it's not enough, we've seen with, with Section 8 We've seen with the LINK program that the city's created, it's not that I favor those programs, but what we have see overall is mostly the government is not gonna be able to afford to subsidize rents at a level to find apartments in places you wanna live without rent regulation. And the reason that we often have, the reason we have successful programs in the city for those programs is because of rent regulation. The ability to move into neighborhoods where there is rent regulated housing, there is still that opportunity. Um, and without, without those controls, you're going to have a situation where no one, where people with low income people are going to have to take vouchers and move somewhere else completely. And ask yourself, you know, to, to use your, your metaphor, your hairdresser isn't going to afford to live in New York City if we don't have a strong system of rent regulation. Okay. Uh, uh, Joe, you mentioned means testing, uh, but that's within the rent regulated system. Well, Do you have about, other ideas well, about let, dealing with the affordable housing issue here? Well, that, uh, number one, I think we should define what affordable is. Um, it's not affordable. Uh, I, I, got a, I received a phone call a couple of weeks ago from an assemblyman out in Bushwick. Mm -hmm. The affordable housing developers who are building uh, are setting aside a portion of their new development for so-called affordable based on uh, lowest right. possible. He said he is livid because you know how much a, um, a studio apartment is going in Bushwick? $3,000 a month. You tell me that's affordable mm -hmm. and affordable to whom? So throughout every debate, and everybody talks about affordability, nobody really gets into the weeds and says who should really be receiving. That's part of the means testing. In, and in terms of other tools that could be used to take care of the poor, right. I mean, I, I am some, and when people talk about the elderly, I never understood because we have a SCREE program mm -hmm. in, the, in the city of New York where se uh, senior citizens making less than $50,000 a year and pay more than one third of their income, their rents are frozen mm -hmm. and the owner gets a tax credit against their real estate taxes. We have a DRE program, people with disabilities. Our argument is get rid of those definitions of you know uh, protected classes and just do it across the board anyone in the city of New York whose income falls below fifty thousand dollars a year and pay more than fifty percent of their income towards rent should be protected the state senate for two consecutive years unanimously passed legislation to protect those people as a tool the assembly never took it up 
So we did a cost-benefit analysis, and the amount of money the city of New York is spending to protect tenants in place who can't afford to pay their rent is approximately $258 million. With all the city programs that are going towards protecting tenants in place instead of putting them into homeless shelters, this is a program that applies and will, you know, will protect 168,000 people who are the poorest of the city of New York. Right. Just, just to be clear for those who aren't into the weeds here, in that program, as you mentioned, uh, the, the landlord gets the, the full rent equivalent by, by tax credit by, through the property tax system. That's correct. Right. So uh, just so we're clear. Uh, uh, Betsy, I'm probably um, going to free you from this question unless you want to answer this. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think I have a fairly simple answer to this question, actually, right. which is I think that, you know, as a at Governor Cuomo, as a, at the state, we've committed two and a half billion dollars to building and preserving right. affordable housing. Um, we run a voucher program. Um, and so I would say that rent regulation is um, one of a myriad of tools um, committed to uh, preserving affordability. Okay. All right. So well, now we can finally get into the individual uh, issues that uh, we talked about. Thank you all. Um, so the first one is uh, vacancy allowance. Uh, this is uh, upon vacancy, a turnover of the unit. Uh, uh, the owner can increase the rent uh, by 20% uh, just based on that uh, 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 turnover. Uh, there are a few exceptions. The 215 law, we've got to preferential. We're not going to get into that. So uh, Judith, um, uh, vacancy allowance causes rents to rise in the stock, but is often cited as encouraging owners to churn tenants. Uh, what do you see in your work? Um, well, that's exactly what we see. We call it the eviction bonus, and that's because it encourages landlords to evict tenants. If you, can ev if you evict a tenant and you get 20% more in rent just because you evicted, not because you painted the apartment, not because you did a single improvement in that apartment, we often see apartments that got absolutely no maintenance and then upon turnover get 20 you know get to raise the rent by 20 percent it's and in the l poorest neighborhoods we see this over and over we see landlords evicting tenants and and every year getting a 20 percent vacancy we see a lot of fraud with it as well because it's such so lucrative for a landlord and it drives the rents ever higher and it's driving rents out of the system and I think that Jesse's slide, which we saw before, made this really clear. Um, you know, so what you see is landlords who don't provide basic habitability. No heat, no hot water. Well, how long are you going to stay with you and your kids when you have no heat and hot water? You're going to turn over that apartment. Um, and the, so what it we creates would like an incentive. To see, it creates an incentive to for absolutely. This turnover we see this happen. over and over. We right. see turnover right. of low rent apartments, and we see the increases in rent. Um, our the proposal that we have is to eliminate the vacancy bonus. We see no reason for a landlord to get 20 percent for doing absolutely nothing in the apartment. It creates perverse right. incentives, and we think it increases harassment, um, <laughs> and it would would increase um, the ability, it would hmm. decrease the kind of harassment we see every day if we didn't have this bonus. Okay, so why do we need it, Joe? I think that it ignores the fact that you have long-term tenants who have been protected by the system um, at, at a period where owners aren't under this administration receiving any increases at the rent guidelines board. So when you have a long-term vacancy, uh, tenancy, somebody who's been living there for 30, 35 years and has been subsidized for all that period of time. The notion behind the 20% vacancy back in 1997 mm -hmm. was to give uh, the owner that extra necessary resources to be able to put back into their units. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not here to say that 20% should not be looked at again in terms of determining whether it makes sense at that rate or not. But by saying we need to reform it by eliminating, it ignores the fact that <coughs> Uh, you're going to perpetuate the, uh, the subsidy issue of long-term tenants. And most of, and for those people who are using it as for harassment or eviction purposes, well, you can't get an eviction out of a tenant unless uh, um, you go to housing court represented by uh, tenants represented by legal counsel, and then you get a uh, uh, decision to evict them. That's, that doesn't happen um, uh, outside of that. However, <laughs> Well, you could laugh, but that's that's if you have people who are owners who are in fact harassing it. We have how many laws on the books? 
that makes it illegal and criminal to, uh, to illegally harass. You can pass as many laws as you want, but at the end of the day, unless you have strict enforcement, and this is the one area that we, we actually are on the same page, we don't want those bad apples. We don't want those speculators coming in and creating a real problem for those owners of ours who have been third to fourth generation who have made a commitment in terms of the city of New York. Those bad apples should be punished and uh, somehow uh, eliminated. The problem is that we don't use a scalpel to go after them. We use a sledgehammer to, to and we basically put all owners into the same pot as bad apples. Um, anything else? <laughs> okay. Now, um, so, uh, the vacancy allow, are, 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 are allowing an increase. Oh. Uh, huh? no, 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 go, go, go. No, no, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, go ahead, Mark. I thought I was doing the right thing, but go no, ahead. no, I'm happy to have you comment. I, I was talking to Chris, actually, oh, but okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it must have been important. I'll stop this ever. No, I, I would, I guess I would maybe provide a little bit of context. Um, uh, between 2016 and 2017, approximately 35,000 pre-74 regulated apartments um, changed tenants. Um, so, you know, I, I think the question about how to ensure that there is incentive to invest in the apartments and that and that owners who have had long-term tenants are are getting um, the return that they need to maintain the apartments um, and and make a profit. Um, is, is maybe something that could be addressed with a different, I mean, there is something called the longevity bonus as well. So it may be something that could be addressed with a different policy, but, um, but as, as those tenants turn, we do see, not surprisingly, that owners, um, or that the rents in those apartments are increasing basically by the vacancy bonus, if not um, by the vacancy bonus. Mm -hmm. The other thing, the other context, and, and I think Joe um, uh, alluded to this without without the specifics of the data I'm about to give, but is that in 1997, um, when um, the vac concept of the vacancy bonus was introduced, the median contract rent was about $600. So 20% um, was $120 a month or, or 1400 or so dollars a year. The median contract rent is now $1,300, which gets you to over $3,000 for that 20%. So, you know, I think there is room for discussion about um, right. the, the value and the purpose of the vacancy bonus and what is the right policy to achieve that. And then secondly, um, what is, if it were a vacancy bonus, what would the right um, level be? Chris? Let I'll me just, just add oh, one thing, though, okay, that sure. the, um, my colleagues at the Community Service Society have done a fantastic report on, in part, on the eviction bonus. And what they found is the single biggest driver between behind rent increases is the vacancy bonus. Yeah. And so that's why it's important to look very hard at why we have 20% on vacancy, 20% on eviction. Sorry, can I, can I add one, one thing, sure. one piece of context? So, Some um, facts are helpful here. Facts, just the facts, right. So, um, just the facts, what did I just say? I, I wasn't, sorry, I wasn't. Um, I, I would say two other things. One is, um, I think as we talk about rent regulation, we need to, talk, we need to think about both protecting the individuals who are in those apartments and then also um, the ability for someone else to move in, right? And, and as we think about um, the in, the in either case, um, I think it's important uh, for, you know, a sense of, okay, so what is that, what is the extra money that people have in their pockets? What can people afford in, with, with respect to increases? So. Um, we know that um, a sort of typical rent stabilized tenant um, average, right, is making $44,000 a year or so. Okay, so that's, that is an admin assistant or a customer service rep or a graphic designer. Or, and obviously there are lots that are making less. Um, they take $2,800 home after taxes. If they're spending $1,250 on rent, um, which is about 34% of their income, they have $1,500 or so to pay on it. Of everything else. We all live in New York City and we know where that goes, right? So that goes to health insurance, a couple hundred dollars. It goes to an unlimited Metro card, a hundred dollars. It goes to food. Um, it goes to paying off student loans if you're a student. It goes to entertainment, other costs. Fundamentally, when you add all of those things up, you don't have 
disposable income after that. You have $300 maybe after that in this scenario. So when you think about that relative to the, the numbers we were throwing around in terms of 20% increases, it's pretty clear to see that that individual in the apartment wouldn't be able to afford it, but also someone moving back into that apartment afterwards isn't going to be able to afford it. I, I was just going to say, I think, you know, the points that Judith and Betsy are both making in many ways um, are completely consistent with the observations I had earlier, which is when you have a system like this, it creates very perverse incentives. So it is, it's hard to imagine you want a system where you get to raise the rent a lot if you evict somebody from an apartment. That, it's very hard to think that that's a, that that's a good system because it gives, you know, it's exactly the point of it gives landlords incentives to do things that are fundamentally inappropriate, and some of them will find all sorts of ways to do that. At the same time, when the rents are really low, as Joe pointed out, that creates all of the problems I talked about with rent control. What if you had a system where the rents grew over time? So I think the point that Judith had, which is you can't just get rid of rent control tomorrow and call it a day. What you need is to have a thoughtful transition, which includes providing um, some subsidies for low moderate income people to pay higher rents over time, but transition to a system where the rents rise so you don't have these incentives in, the, in a decontrol system to immediately get rid of people and push them out. So you have to kind of think about what is it that you want and how do you want to accomplish it, but allowing people to just get rid of the tenant and you know, raise rents is not a, to my mind, is not a very sensible way of you know, managing a system where you want, you know, where you want people not to be evicted and have protections. Okay, so um, I think we've gotten a few points here uh, that are going to carry through, but one of which is that uh, uh, the vacancy allowance is just one piece of a larger puzzle about how rents go up and preserving uh, versus uh, preserving affordability. Uh, let's move on to the, uh, the next topic, which is the high rent vacancy uh, deregulation. Um, currently a vacant unit uh, <clears throat> with a rent of 27.33 and 75 cents. It's adjusted uh, by uh, statute to the <clears throat> based on rent guidelines board increases. Uh, at that level can be uh, uh, deregulated. Um, as Jesse pointed out, uh, we just did a try and put a little data here that within two vacancy allowances of 2733 are 124,000 units. Uh, so uh, if, if the only thing motivating uh, landlords was uh, to, to get the, uh, to the, <clears throat> the vacancy uh, deregulation uh, limit, uh, the vacancy allowance at this point uh, uh, at immediately at risk uh, uh, would be the 124,000 out of uh, something short of a million that we've got, just to give an order of magnitude about this. Um, so, Betsy, I was going to turn to you first, but you've already mentioned uh, the governor's position on this. Um, do you have any data on how many have units have been lost since '93 that wouldn't have been lost if there had been no vacancy allowance? Have, have, uh, have you all been able to do any analysis here as to it's vacancy what allowance are? or vacancy decontrol? Well, um, so, if you if you didn't right. hit that, if you weren't sort of pass the post or if right. you or vacancy allowance. Um, I, I can tell you that I can tell you the second about vacancy okay, go ahead. De uh, decontrol, um, which is that between 93 and 2011, about 133,000 apartments left regulation, 127,000 of them from vacancy decontrol. Okay. So obviously, if you eliminate vacancy decontrol, you'd have those units back. Right, right. Um, I, I, I think we won't do the math here. Okay. The, the point is just uh, I was trying to tie together the vacancy allowance, how it helps you get over uh, to this limit. But let's just move on here. And um, so, uh, uh, Judith, what's the justification for subjecting high, high rent units uh, to rent stabilization? Why should rents above 2,700 be rent stabilized? Well, I, as I said, I think what's important to remember is that it is not just a system of of ways to regulate rents, it is a good cause eviction. Um, and that's really, really important for tenants, and quite frankly, it's important to tenants at all levels of income. Because even tenants who can pay, even you students who are going to pay more in rent, you might not want your landlord to be able to evict you because you complain about heat and hot water. 
And I talk to, truthfully, I get calls all the time from people who don't qualify for me because they earn too much money, who nonetheless have pretty horrible conditions and are wondering why they're well, not protected. And they're Judith, not protected Judith, because of rent stabilization. Is, but let me, let a me good finish. Good cause uh, eviction, I believe, in other places exists even without rent. But we don't that have so that in New York how, State. Ah, so that's but, but we want to have it in New York State, okay. and we should have it in New York State, but we don't. Okay. So the only way you have good cause protections, so protections against your landlord for evicting you basically for any reason. So if you don't live in a rent regulated apartment or another type of subsidized apartment, your landlord could wake up tomorrow and says, you have red hair and I don't like people with red hair and I'm gonna evict you for that. Total, could be a totally <coughs> arbitrary reason as long as it's not discriminatory. And so, so that's, that's the only really, reason so for that's, higher no, no. income? The other reason is, is that we see a lot, we, because of the vacancy bonus, we see rents driven very, very high. People aren't paying those high rents because the market can't uh, support it, right. right? So I see deregulated apartments in the Bronx where the landlord is saying, you're deregulated, I'm not gonna, you know, you don't have protections, you complain about heat, you're definitely gonna be out and your rent is $1,000 a month. So that is not, so if you take, a, if you get rid of deregulation, you're going to both protect those tenants and you're going to protect them from unjust increases. And this would help the people that, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your name. Chris. Chris, Chris. <laughs> the people That's that a Chris, good trick. Chris said that he was concerned about, like young people moving into the city, young people moving into the city would be protected, not just from unjust evictions, but from unjust rent increases as well, if we had, if we got rid of deregulation, because your apartments, even if they're high rent, would stay, you would know every year what the increase was gonna be by the Rent Guidelines Board, and you would also be protected. And taking, t taking apartments out of the system merely exacerbates the kind of problems that we see in this city. Mm -hmm. And what, let me just say, when, I, when we first had deregulation, look, there's only one of me who's supporting rent regulation on this panel, so like, give me a minute here. Oh, whoa. Um, oh. <laughs> there's a neutral party, and then there are two against parties. <laughs> wait, I, I think, okay, I so think. Let, so uh, wait, let me finish, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Thank so, you for that clarification. <laughs> So, you know, I think that we have, to, I think that you have to look at this, you know, this system as a whole. When we first, when I first started doing this work, which is longer ago than I want to think about, people told, in, in 1994, they said, well, we're never going to see a $2,000 rent in New York City. Never going to see it. Okay? We know where inflation and rent increases lead us. And what my colleagues on the other side won't tell you is they're just counting on that, right? Like as rents increase, we'll lose more units and then none of you will have good cause evictions and none of you will have protection from rent increases. And that's really what's going on and that's why we have to get rid of that system. And we also need good cause eviction for everyone and we need protections against unjust um, rent increases for everyone and we should be pushing for that as well. We don't need I, applause. I, I, I got the point. It, it would be <laughs> helpful not to be broad brush characterized, so I appreciate not. There's no reason to link protections for tenants with rent control. Those can be those can be com done completely separately, and those who necessarily may view rent control as not the ideal system in no sense are necessarily arguing that we should just have a free world where you know landlords can do whatever they want and tenants have no rights. So, um, listen, so uh, I don't uh, know why I don't know why we would link those two together. All right, we, we um, got in the many point. other places. We though. got the point. So uh, Joe, uh, I, I think uh, uh, RSA uh, rent, uh, rent Stabilization Association has argued that vacant control is responsible for an overall improvement in the city's housing stock. Yeah, we well, have. Uh, so um, t tell us why you think this is important. It's not ours. Housing vacancy studies. You know, the average building in the city of New York is approximately 80 years old, right. and their own studies have indicated because of the um, uh, added resources owners are getting through rents and other words, is that they've been putting it back in their building and the housing stock is the best it's ever been, you know, if it's today than it's ever been in the past. Right. Um, the key to any ref real reform as we do go to Albany and fight these issues out is what's the balance? How do we balance uh, limiting rents towards tenants, because this is a very expensive city, 
versus the, what's the right formula to allow owners, responsible owners, in terms of their rate of return. And my greatest fear is that, no, because nobody's debating it, they're all you know, being, um, making arguments based on their political uh, positions, that, and I pointed it out earlier, you don't want a situation, and, and most of the elected officials weren't even born in back in the 60s, in the late 60s, early 70s, when the Bronx was burning, uh, you had uh, Bannerman even in the, uh, on the west side, and, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. So you don't want to go back to those days again. And ultimately, whatever is going to get enacted, whether it's in April or June, needs to recognize that unless you have a fair rate of return for owners and investors, um, if you don't, they're going to leave New York. And what's going to be left is the, is the people on the sidelines who are uh, waiting to come in and swoop up these properties. And these are not the kind of landlords you want running these kind of buildings. These are the speculators. The third, fourth generation, when they've had it, they're going to walk away and say, we're done. There are people already have basically moved out of New York and invested down in the South. We need to make sure that we create a, a continual climate in New York that says, we want you here, and we need to deal with and address some of the issues and abuses that occur on all sides. But does that, that mean we need a threshold uh, um, that it deregulates above that threshold? Well, you know, it's, How it, does that play into what you just said? Well, since the governor's taken a very strong position that he's going to close the door <laughs> on future deregulation, right. I mean, it's a mood issue. You, it doesn't really matter what you, in terms of the arguments, because right. uh, clearly the people who've been taking uh, and moving into these new buildings are the ones who can well afford to pay the rent, and now you're going to end up. And that's part of, it's tied into the issue of means testing. Who should be receiving the benefits of those rent stabilized units? Nobody wants to have that kind of a debate. Mm -hmm. uh, people, the advocates have said, well, we're not here to protect tenants, we're here to protect apartments. Our position, for those of you who are trying to get apartments, you'll never get those apartments because the people who are there can well afford to pay higher rents will remain there and be subsidized. So I'm not even going to comment anymore about shutting the door because that's clearly, in my opinion, everybody's on board in doing that. Mm -hmm. But from a policy perspective, and it goes, ties into the economics, you go to any other city, you go to Chicago, you go to other places where there is no rent regulation, and based on your ability to afford whatever rent you can, you can get an apartment. Okay. Anybody else want to comment before we go on to preferential rents, another topic? Okay. All right. Um, preferential rents. So uh, this is uh, another area of reform that's con uh, currently under consideration, as we noted uh, before. Um, so um, I'm going to add a few uh, interesting facts here uh, that at least I think are interesting with regard to preferential rents. As, as you all know uh, or have seen, uh, over the last few years, 28 to 32 percent, something in that range has been said to be uh, uh, the percent of units that are receiving preferential uh, rents. Um, preferential rents can happen in a number of different ways. Um, and uh, one way, uh, so I won't just want to take a little look at it. Let's actually, let, <clears throat> can I read this thing here? All right, uh, page down. So here, here's an interesting uh, chart. Uh, the IBO put together for us. We asked them if they would do that. All of you uh, thinking about preferential rents, obviously the conversation, and uh, um, I'll give obviously Judith a, a chance to talk about it, uh, are people at uh, paying lower rents. The truth of the matter is, or a fact here, not that that isn't true, uh, but a, a different fact is that we find the preferential rents are highest as a percent of uh, uh, rents at the higher legal rents. And one of the reasons that uh, this may be true, and so I'm going to give you a little more facts on it, <laughs> is that uh, New entrants uh, to the rent stabilization system include 421A, uh, and 421A apartments are either at um, market rent to begin with, or they are um, uh, uh, controlled through the affordable housing program through uh, different uh, limits. So it wouldn't be surprising that those apartments are being charging less than preferential rent because. <laughs> A market rate unit tends to turn over more often. Turnover allows, at least under the current system, rent, the legal rent to rise higher. And so we're finding that, uh, this was a surprise to me, um, that uh, 
a lot of the preferential rents are at the higher rent levels. So they are, they could very well be a lot of them 421A uh, units. So uh, don't have uh, the details on that. Um, but um, uh, you, and this only goes up to 2,700. You saw that there are a bunch of uh, rent regulated apartments uh, above that level. Uh, those presumably also are in uh, 421A. Uh, Article uh, 11, I learned uh, just yesterday, those uh, start out with preferential rents below the legal rent. That's the way the city sets those uh, rents. So when we think about preferential rents, it's uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, th there is, as we found out in most of this discussion, there's a whole range of situations where this uh, uh, has become an issue. So uh, Judith, why don't you talk a little bit about what's the change in legislation that you uh, would like to see? Um, and um, we could talk a little bit about who, what rent, which of the tenants, uh, if, if not all of them here, are uh, uh, what you're uh, concerned about. Um, all right, well, so in 2003, before 2003, um, if you had a preferential rent, which um, is a situation where the tenant is um, offered a rent that's less than what the landlord claims is the legal rent uh, that you, he could charge, before 2003, that tenant was entitled to have that rent plus applicable rent guidelines board increases while they live there. 2003, that was swept away. And the new rule set by, you know, the Republicans was that the, that the landlord could raise the rent on any vacancy lease. What does that mean for tenants? It means that that, that right of tenure, that right not to be evicted except for a good reason, is sort of swept away, right? So we see preferential rent tenants all the time, and they are not able to assert their rights to, to decent, affordable housing, right? So they, so we go into buildings that, uh, and the organizers will tell you, we go into buildings, and when we, and when the tenants find out they have a preferential rent, they're like, no, I can't sue my landlord. If I sue my landlord, my preferential rent will be revoked. If I do anything to make my landlord unhappy, even if it means that I'm going to live in horrible conditions. I won't do it for that reason. And that's really, it really goes to why we, why those tenants need protection and why we really need to go back to the rule that was before in 2003 and didn't ruin the world before, seems like it would be fine now. But it would also be important because it really would help almost 30% 30 per, 30 of the entire rent regulated stock is now paying preferential rent. and. If you take out the 421A apartments, um, which are being charged, those tenants are being charged preferential rents by HPD. We actually think, for reasons that we will not get into here because it's too complicated, that that's not actually allowed under the 421A program. But let's put that aside. You take out those apartments, and the top seven, seven zip codes where there are the most preferential rent tenants are all in the Bronx. Last I checked, people in the Bronx are pretty low income. And they are not people paying, you know, who can afford high rents. And they're the people who are living in the worst conditions with some of the most predatory landlords. And we really need to do, make this change so that those tenants can once again feel safe in their homes. And so that we don't have the churning that I talked about before with the, with the eviction bonus. Because what you see is these two things are linked. Give a tenant a preferential rent, they get evicted, you get a 20% eviction bonus. Isn't that a great system? So let's go back, let's protect tenants who are actually in their homes right now, and, and when they leave, the landlord can raise the rent to the market rent, I mean to the uh, legal registered rent, assuming it is legal. And let me also say that in court papers filed in a case, the, the, the state agency in charge of housing found that 50%, when they did an audit, 50%, of preferential rents, when they looked at what the legal rents were, were not the legal rents, 50%. So we see a lot of fraud. We see a lot of people with bait and switch, right? So I see tenants, they get offered a preferential rent, and they think, oh, that's great. They're so nice to me. And they don't realize that it's actually above what the legal rent should be. So we, you know, 
the whole yeah, I, I, okay. thing I mean, is we, right. Fraud is a problem, and the, and the perverse incentives, I think we've gone through that. So I, I, you're making a good so point the, here, so the but policy I don't mean, we don't need to spend more see. time here. So right. the policy that we want to see is go back to the way it was in 2003, protect tenants, right and make the preferential rent, the legal rent, as long as that tenant so, lives so in So, Drew, if it turns out that, um, and I, I move back so people can have the tweet here, that it's really th these much higher, uh, are, there's a s significant number of people getting preferential rents who are much higher, and we don't have the facts, income, not just yeah. higher rent. Well, I, right? yeah, Is can that, I add one fact for you? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so. So the, so the number across the board is 30%. The number, if we just isolate for pre-74 buildings, is 24%. Okay. That doesn't necessarily... Could you take the microphone a little closer to you? Thank you. Is that good? Can you hear me? So the number... No, you can't hear me. I'm sorry. Is this a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. Why didn't someone say that before? <laughs> Have you heard me before? Um, so the number for across the board is 30%, right? 30% of all rent regulated units are offering preferential rates. If you, if you just do, if you isolate for just pre-74 buildings, it's 24%. That doesn't necessarily equate perfectly to what right. you're saying, but yeah. it's a good proxy. Right. So, um, Juice, does it make sense to do this across the board here? And you mentioned where this is a problem, but do we really want people who are paying $3,000, $4,000 a month in those apartments who have moved in. Well, you if know, you're already uh, getting three thousand dollars a month, why isn't that okay? Why isn't that enough? What would be enough, really? I mean, you're talking about. Okay, All right, so okay, there are, I got there the are question. three. <laughs> All right, I got the question, Joe. There are, wait, I, I, there are we're running out of time. Okay, there are so. three zip codes in Manhattan you're talking about: um, Stuy Town and Hell's Kitchen. There's a lot of 421A buildings there, but there yeah, are people yeah. who are, you know, should be. If they are living in affordable housing, the landlord got a lot of tax incentives for those buildings. Why should they get even more? I don't understand that. Let's look at the seven zip codes in the Bronx. You want to talk about that? Highbridge, Morris Heights, Melrose, uh, uh, okay. Bathgate, I, East uh, Tremont, Drew, Kingsbridge, Drew, Northwood. We, we, get, we got the point. I think everybody here understands it. Uh, uh, and we're, we're getting short on time. Joe, do you All want right. to comment on let me, this? Let me just, preferential rent is just another tool. There are, for those who abuse it, you go after them. Those who... Uh, who find that the Rent Guidelines Board hasn't given them an increase uh, to cover their expenses in the last seven years. It's an opportunity to make up for those, price, uh, those prices. Back in 2010, and since uh, I'll divulge what happened in 2010 when the Democrats were in control of the Senate, we had substantive discussions with the leadership there to deal with the issue of preferential rents. The anecdotal arguments were that people were being suckered in, got a preferential rent, and then when their uh, lease was up uh, for renewal, they would jack them up to uh, legal rent. We never really heard about it, but that was an argument that was proposed. So we suggested if you really believe that to be the case, and we don't know what it is, why don't we create, a, create certain triggers so that no increase can go above the price index that uh, even the, right, uh, that the city of New York recognizes for operating expenses on an annual basis. Nobody wanted to do it. They would rather have the total reform or the elimination versus having any kind of compromise. When the city of New York has embarked on either zero increases or very low increases, when the price index is at 6% six, six, six on an annual basis, the people who utilize preferential have told their tenants that they've increased it in order to accommodate the fact that the government itself has not provided them the necessary expenses. So we could reform it by eliminating it or doing the right thing and, and, and dealing with a safety net so that owners can utilize it when they need a cash infusion and tenants are protected from double-digit increases in uh, changing neighborhoods. So um, I'm going to actually move to uh, uh, some questions that we have here and uh, use the first question as a way to talk a little bit about what uh, Joe just uh, referred to, which is uh, the basic rent guidelines board increases and how they compare uh, to the cost increases. There is, the Rent Guidelines Board uh, puts together uh, a great deal of very helpful information. If all of you haven't looked at it, you should. Um, and one of the things they do is put together a price index uh, or an index uh, for, of costs. And um, I did a little quick calculation to show how much over since 2002 the cost in, uh, <coughs> costs have gone up, according to that index at least compared to how much one-year rent increases would have increased. And uh, it may uh, not surprise anybody here that uh, the cost went up um, 
130 uh, percent, and uh, mainly driven, uh, largely driven by taxes, property taxes, and water and right. sewer. Um, I ha have all the facts here, but have not. Uh, we don't have time to go through that. Um, well, uh, the one-year rent increases would have only allowed a 53 percent increase. So. You know, one way to think about this is if you got rid of all of these other, quote, loopholes, uh, or whatever we want to call all these other provisions, and we didn't have time, I apologize for talking about MCIs as well. Um, if you got rid of all those, you'd be down to what this, the basic annual increases are. Um, and in order for 130% increase in costs to be absorbed by landlords who get an increase in, of 53% over that period of time, it would have to be true that the costs were only 41% of their total revenue. Uh, and as many of you uh, may know, uh, operating costs in the city are somewhere between 800 and $1,000. Uh, again, really great data in the rent guidelines board uh, stuff. And the average rent is uh, something like uh, 1200 or $1,300. So it's closer to 66%, which means if you eliminated all these things, which is what's, I think, behind part of what Joe said, uh, and something to think about as we change the system where there's all these things are interrelated. They're all part of a, a package. If you change that, uh, um, all these other pieces, um, then we'd really need to focus on what the annual increases are. Uh, and so I got a question here from uh, a member of the audience. Wouldn't it be better to allow rents to go up by a number, maybe an index, uh, instead of um, um, the way the system now works? Um, well, actually, what I think, if you look at the Rent Guidelines Board increases over time, um, under the Republican mayors, both Giuliani and Bloomberg, um, those increases were actually quite high. And if you look at the increases over time, I think what you would see is the last few years are really just a correction of what had been <coughs> too high increases um, that happened over time. I, I think what I'm saying, is, is there a better system than that? I mean, I, 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 I got the, you got the politics, well, that, again, that's a good point. I, but you, no, it's very political now how me, this happened. But, to, but, but in terms of reform, though, what we are talking about, okay. we're talking about state okay. reforms. Rent Guidelines Board reform is not on our agenda. What's on our agenda I, is... I didn't ask what's on your agenda. <laughs> I did not ask what's on your agenda. I asked whether it should be on the agenda. Yes, and well, I, I, we think we it have. shouldn't be because we think it more than adequately compensates landlords. Let me just okay. say that the, the Rent Guidelines Board is as political. It doesn't matter who the mayor of the city of New York is. It's a political operation where everyone is going to say, we're going to limit your increases and we'll wink maybe next year we'll increase it higher. If you really want to do the right thing, then you eliminate RGB, create a formula, non-political formula based on certain objective standards and, and with certain safety valves in there to prevent double-digit increases, and you basically say, listen, one year, owners are going to benefit. One year, tenants are going to benefit. Because once you remove the political process from it, I think you, you actually have a better product. Okay. Can, I, can I just make one? For the students sure. in the room as you kind of listen to this and kind of ask the question, is this the direction that is going to make housing more available, et cetera, and affordable for people coming into the city? As, we, as you just sort of listen to all of the nuances, all of the rules, the incredibly technical debates about all of this, and ask the question about cities that are more affordable, who don't have the same set of issues, where there is more construction and you don't have the details of this, um, that are very hard. You know, honestly, there are many places in this country that don't have that, and I think they have plenty of minority um, residents with protections on places to live. And I think the, the challenges of this system are the more regulation you put in, the more loopholes there are, the more things you have to close, and the more complex things get. And okay. to some extent, that's, that's kind of the question. Do we want to continue to go down this path, or do we want to sort of try and find a way that takes us away from this path, but towards something that is meeting the goals of making safe, affordable, and secure housing available? So here's a provocative question along those uh, uh, lines. When there are so many people moving into New York City and such a high demand for apartments, with a very, very low uh, vacancy rate. Is it realistic to say that if we eliminate the vacancy bonus, MCIs, preferential rents, 
uh, et cetera, that landlords will abandon their buildings. It's, really? Will they abandon their buildings? It's totally unrealistic. I, mean, I didn't ask you, Judith. I didn't ask you, Judith. Speculation. Look at what we see about building. Look at what, I mean, the idea Judith, that we don't hey, see Judith, rampant building I mean, in New York City, I guess you live in a different I, city I, than I do, and you definitely don't live in Brooklyn, because all I see is cranes and more you know, luxury housing being Judith, built. Judith, thank, thank you. Okay. I mean, no, that's, you, you that's a fair comment, but let's let other people um, speak here. You what happened? Months. Well, then again, you, you were around in the 1960s and the 70s when you saw or abandonment. I'm and older what than I look. It? Well, let me just say, uh, <laughs> you look great. So. Okay, but the fact is that there was abandonment, and 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 what precipitated that that kind of um, abandonment? Because I remember I was living in the Bronx in a rent-controlled apartment, and the Yankees were playing, and three blocks away there was a fire, another building going up in flames. Why? Because the rent levels were insufficient to cover the expenses of running that building. All I point to you is that unless you have the ability for an owner to have the wherewithal to be able to cover their expenses, and one of the things we didn't talk about is that you have all these other mandates government imposes on owners that are not part of the Rank Guidelines Board, whether it's uh, the facade laws, lead laws, et cetera. If you don't provide the ability for, if you cut it off every single spigot, then you will, maybe not immediate, because there are always going to be those people on the sidelines ready to jump in and, and grab it and pay 50 cents on the dollar, and you're always going to have pension funds and other hedge funds which you don't want coming into the city and buying up those, those buildings. But the long-term reality is that you're not going to have investment in the city of New York, and at some point, at least in the, in the areas that haven't been gentrified or are very low income, you will, in fact, see an impact on the quality of housing in those buildings because people aren't going to put money into those buildings at all. Okay, those are the two positions. Yes, <laughs> I guess. Betsy, would you like to weigh in? It looks like you have. The neutral voice. I think that. <laughs> That's why I give you room to. I love it, I get to play clean up here. Um, <laughs> I, I think I would just say that I don't think we're characterizing the, the, the intent of the conversation that it's going to happen uh, in January and beyond to be turning off the spigot um, of everything. I think the intent is to have a conversation that does balance um, the needs, but but to recognize um, all of the pressures and perverse incentives that exist in the current system. Okay, so I'm going to give a, a, a final round here for people to make a final comments if they they'd like to, but. We have a question for Chris, so I, it's so uh, out of left field, let me just uh, give this to you. My ally. <laughs> so how does restrictive zoning yeah. fit within uh, the political, political economy of rent regulation? If you lift rent regulation but keep restrictive zoning, don't you put tenants between a rock and a hard place? So I think zoning is the other piece so of it. So we're talking about supply here. Right. There are two things about supply. One of them is rent regulation, but the other is zoning. Right. And we could have a whole separate panel on this, but I think you would not be surprised to hear me say I'd like us in general to relax zoning to allow more construction. At the same time, we have to take some of the money that comes from that and put it into public transportation because we can't live it, you know, we can't live with more people in the city without having public transportation that works and works reliably. Okay. So the solution involves both of those things in order, to, you can't just do one without the other. All right. Okay, I'm going to just give you all a chance for a one or two sentence a final comment. If you want to make one, you can pass pass on this. But uh, uh, our time is almost up. So, uh, do you want to start, Judith? Um, well, obviously, we are hoping this year that with um, a different uh, political outlook in Albany, that we are going to see protections for tenants that we have not seen in a long time. And the three things that were that are our top priorities are eliminating vacancy decontrol, um, eliminating the eviction bonus, and go, taking preferential rents back to protecting tenants and making sure that long-term tenants can have these for uh, the, the duration of their tenancy. And the, the important thing here is what's really at risk, and I think you can see this from the slides that were presented at the beginning, is are we going to live in a city that's an integrated city? Are we going to live in a city where there are, going to, there are apartments for low-income people? Are we going to live in a city that protects immigrants? I didn't talk about that before, but rent regulation is the most important source of housing for immigrants. Um, are we going to have the, a city that is 
a truly mixed income city or are we gonna have a city that's only for the highest income people? And I wanna say that that's the city we should be living in. That's why this fight is so critical right now. And anyone who wants to join us, come join us in Albany this year, we need you. All right, thank you, Judith. Joe? Well, even if everything that you just said uh, uh, occurred up in Albany, it will not change the fact that um, we're never going to have, there's a greater demand for housing here that will never be met. That's the reality. Um, people will continue coming here and getting apartments that become vacant based on their ability to pay that, uh, with the, their income. We have a, we do have an income crisis in the city of New York. We have, everybody recognizes one every, every five people here are poor. Uh, and we need to address that issue through other legislation. But at the end of the day, you need to encourage investment, development, using other tax programs to create housing. If you shut it down, which may or may not happen, because we don't know, then you will have a consequence, unintended consequence, in New York, where people at some point, all the students, was, just look at Washington, D.C., that's a booming city. People are gonna make a determination at some point that New York is not the place for them to live. Chris, you want to? I'm going to let uh, Betsy go last here. Okay. So she's um, the neutral party. Right. I think that I think this the topic is an incredibly important topic. We need to deal with housing and affordability. It's got to happen through greater investment in housing in New York. And without it, we're not going to have the kind of housing we'd like. And if we think about New York as a city of immigrants. You know, many immigrants today find New York um, very expensive and hard to get to because, of course, rent stabilization protects the incumbents and not the people who are moving in. And so where you look at immigrants going are other kinds of places around the United States where housing is, in fact, more available and more affordable. And so we have to kind of think about what the system is, the unintended consequences, and recognize that we don't live in a static system. We can't take everything for, give, for granted as the way it is. It comes based on incentives. And if we don't have more investment and sort of generate a reasonable system, I don't think where we are today is something that we would look at and say, this is really a great place to be and we want to perpetuate more of it. That's it. Um. Well, first, I think it's it's um, it's fun to play the neutral party for an hour and a half. If you talk to my husband, you'd hear I'm pretty opinionated. So neutral is not necessarily the word he would use. But um, uh, thank you again to Furman um, for for this conversation. It's obviously not the first conversation, um, although it's the first time I've met Chris. But that that those of us at, on the table have had also, you know, I think. Um, it's fair to say there is a huge amount of expertise in the room. So while the four of us are on the panel, I, um, I look forward to continuing conversations among us and among all of us um, in the upcoming months. I think um, I have great optimism um, that, uh, that we um, will see good reform in, in the upcoming months. Um, and I guess I would just re take the opportunity to reiterate that um, the administration is um, interested in eliminating vacancy deed control, ensuring landlords aren't rewarded um, financially for schemes to force tenants out, relook at the formulas um, for rent increases for building and apartment improvements, and make preferential rent um, the legal rent for the life of the tenancy. So thank you again. So let's thank the panel.